you know, John, to you first. Weeks after Michael Brown's parents testified to the U.N., you have the Committee Against Torture calling the grand jury decision a tragedy. Uh, they said, though, they had to respect the decision of authorities not to prosecute Officer Darren Wilson. But how significant do you think it is that the U.N. considered this shooting in their report in the first place? I think it's quite significant. Um, it's significant that the U.N. is speaking up regarding this. It's significant that the U.N. Uh, would invite Michael Brown's family uh, to come and allow them to share their story along with several protest leaders here in St. Louis. And as we have seen in recent days, protests have been across the country. I think that, I think that speaks volumes uh, regarding the injustice that we have seen. You know, Brianna, many people are disappointed with that decision uh, that there was no indictment on any type of charges. People, people here at least, uh, especially African Americans, uh, lost what little confidence they had in the justice system uh, when that announcement was made and were very disappointed. Um, and so I'm hoping that the family of Michael Brown will find some type of justice uh, in the coming months for the death of their son. Yeah, there is this, they want a law passed, obviously, that would have body cams on officers. They also want, though, to take perhaps civil reprisal in this. The, I, I wonder what you think, Tom, because this UN report, it says that there is concern about the militarization of U.S. police departments. This is the UN pointing a finger at the U.S. on this. First of all, Brianna, that's absurd. And coming from them, it's even more absurd. I was on the board of Interpol. I ran FBI international operations for five years. I have met with law enforcement officials around the world for many, many years. What they're astounded at is the militarization of the U.S. public. They cannot believe we allow assault rifles in the hands of private citizens, armor-piercing shells in the heart, uh, hands of private citizens, body armor that can be purchased by private citizens. That's unbelievable to them. Many of these countries, even large ones like China, their police officers on the street don't even carry weapons. If they're going to do a raid, they check them out and go do it and then check them back in afterward. So they're, they're looking at our society like it's still Wild West, uh, and that's what police face. So that's what the real leadership of law enforcement around the world thinks when they look at the United States. What do you think about this proposal that Michael Brown's family wants? They want officers to wear body cams. Would I that agree. work? Yeah, I agree with that. Why? You know, years ago when I was a police officer, I would have probably fought against that and said this is terrible to be under this kind of, of pressure. Nowadays, I think most, most police officers on the street would welcome it to show what they're up against. And I think until you've seen even the dash cams on some cameras that show how people can become so aggressive with a police officer for no reason, or the degree of intoxication, or the public official in Texas that was threatening the police officers, uh, the prosecutor who, luckily, the dash cam proved the officer's right in that case. So I think uh, most law enforcement officers now, and if I was on the street now, I'd say, put that camera on. I'm not turning it off. I want you to see what I see when someone comes at me. The demon look that Officer Wilson, I've talked to a number of, you know, of uh, police officers recently about that comment, and they comment what I say. We have all seen that look. There is, a, there is a time when a person can become so aggressive, so excited, so amped up, as many police officers call it. It can be drugs, it can be adrenaline. We've seen the look in the eyes of someone who basically that look says, I'm going to kill you. And it's just hard to describe, but I don't know a police officer that's been on the street that hasn't seen that look at least once in somebody on the street. Sean, you've been urging people to come together in the wake of violent protests this week. Also today, though, uh, you tweeted encouragement for this Black Friday civil disobedience. You also said in this tweet, black lives don't matter to Missouri Governor Jay Nixon. Do you, do you really feel that way? The problem is we're concerned of that our governor has yet to really do a lot to provide justice for our community. He created the state of emergency so quickly. However, when he came down to the night of the announcement, um, there were not enough um, support of National Guardsmen in in Ferguson, particularly to protect those businesses. And so our concern is simply that under the state of emergency, the governor at any moment can offer and um, put to pl put in place a special prosecutor to then put together a real grand jury we find will be transparent and we can have justice for our community. 
us, this is the reason why we're having this Black Out Friday. And we're saying that if black lives don't matter, maybe green lives, money will matter to those in the sales tax to really create change and transformation for our region. So you're feeling sort of the broader issues that all of this has revealed in the last few months. And obviously there is a need, not just in Ferguson, not just in Missouri, beyond that, for there to be better relations between communities, between black communities and police departments. And are you feeling like there's just no progress uh, that has really been made in, in that regard? There's been little progress, um, and we are hoping that that will change. Um, there are many persons, community activists, clergy, other organized groups that want to work and have been working in the past with law enforcement. Law enforcement, we're not against law enforcement. Um, we who have been on the ground, we want officers to go home, but we also want our black and brown children to also go home and to be safe. And so our goal is to create a beloved community, Dr. King would say, that we can all work together, be diverse, represent and understand the differences, but still have one goal in mind, which is that we all matter and that the human race matters and we can all come together in one accord. To, to that end, John, uh, the NAACP is, is setting off on this 120-mile, seven-day march. It's tomorrow it starts, and it's called Journey for Justice, Ferguson to Jefferson City. This is going to go to Governor Nixon's residence, I believe, is where it ends. What does this march mean to supporters of Michael Brown? Well, the message should be, uh, if Governor Jay Nixon will not come and sit down with us, if he won't come to us, take this, we'll come to you. Uh, and so Governor Nixon has completely, uh, his lack of leadership is something that needs to be reevaluated. Uh, Governor Nixon has done very little when it comes to funding for education in African American communities. He's done very little when it comes to diversity with the Missouri Highway Patrol. Uh, he's done very little when it comes to jobs within our communities. I have to agree with the pastor here today. I hope that the message will be sent today that obviously green does matter because here in America, African Americans spend one trillion dollars. That's what their buying power is, yet they make less than whites. And so hopefully the governor will also see that statement made when it comes to sales tax today. But I believe uh, the march over the weekend will be successful. And each day there will be some reflection on how many steps will it take physically to get justice for Michael Brown and black and brown lives did lie in the street every 23 days that are killed by law enforcement. All right, and we will be watching that. CNN will be there uh, covering this March, 120 miles, seven days, and it starts tomorrow. John, thank you for being with us. Sean, really appreciate it. Tom, always good to have you here.